Well, as the children are being dismissed, uh, this morning, we're going to learn about peacemakers from Jesus. He told us, blessed are the peacemakers, so we're going to take a look at that, but we're going to find that the Bible's idea of a peacemaker is very different from the idea of a peacemaker in our culture. Did you know that Colt manufactured a, a gun, a revolver, and they called it a peacemaker, and uh, it's actually known as the gun that won the West? And uh, the B-36 bomber was a nuclear, uh, pl a plane made to carry nuclear bombs long distances. And that particular plane was known as the peacemaker. So the world has a very different idea than Jesus when he talked about being a peacemaker. And this morning we're going to see what the Bible says about being peacemakers uh, in Christ. Well, please uh, open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. In verse 9, we'll pick up uh, from where we left off last week. Here Jesus tells us, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And please bow your heads with me. Father, we do pray that, that this morning you reveal to us the meaning of this amazing promise to be called your sons and daughters, Lord. This is our true heart's desire. It's why we're here this morning. Help us understand deep in our hearts what you mean by being a peacemaker, Lord. Guide my lips and may only your words be exalted this morning. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Well, the beatitude we're looking at this morning is the last beatitude in which we receive the blessing through our obedience to Jesus by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The two after the one we'll look at today are very different. But each of the seven uh, characteristics of those who follow Jesus that we call the Beatitudes that we've looked at so far, they all flow, as we looked at last week, from putting on Jesus in every circumstance. The two Beatitudes that we'll look at in the future that follow Blessed Are the Peacemakers are the result of living out the first seven. Unlike the others, we don't obey them to receive their blessings. The next two, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, and blessed are those who are persecuted for the name of Jesus, well, uh, these last two are very different kinds of promises. They're not actions or attitudes that we put on in Christ. They're actually done to us by those who don't believe the truth. And these persecutions are performed by those who are offended by the truth of Christ. So they become hostile to those who are living the truth in Jesus. Now, by observing the very unpeaceful nature of the last two Beatitudes, the 8th and the ninth Beatitudes, it's very clear that the first thing this morning we can learn about making peace is that even though we are to be peacemakers, we will not always have peace with those who reject the truth. That's the first thing we can learn just by reading it in context. The next point we should take away from this beatitude is found in the book of James, chapter 3. Verses 14 through 18, this is what James wrote. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every other evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Notice James said make peace. So we know James was commenting on Jesus' words here. But uh, he just summarized even several of the Beatitudes. Pure as in pure in heart. Peaceable as in peacemakers. Gentle and willing to yield as in meek. And full of mercy as in merciful. He also revealed what the opposite of a pure heart is, one that's full of bitter envy, self-seeking, 
boasting, lies, partiality, and hypocrisy. Then James clearly tells us what I really want to focus on this morning. We are to sow the fruit of righteousness in peace, not war or violence. A different way of explaining what James just told us is, we are to live out the righteous life that we've been called to in peace as peacemakers. Now, unfortunately, throughout history, there were those who claimed to be serving Christ as they made war under a banner of the cross. James made it very clear, however, this type of person is not serving Jesus. The Crusades, the Inquisitions, witch burnings, abortion bombings, any unpeaceful action ever taken in the name of Jesus toward anyone, such as Jews, Muslims, homosexuals, or any other group, are all disobedient to the teachings of Christ. These actions were not pure, peaceable, gentle, meek, merciful, or godly in any way. Instead, they were sensual, earthly, and demonic, and they blasphemed the truth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're never to be hateful, violent, or mean-spirited toward any human being in the name of Christ. If we do anything in the name of Jesus, it must be peaceful. This beatitude is fulfilled in the same way as the others, by putting on Christ in his heart. But this one serves as a capstone that made sure we did not force Christ's teaching on anyone. We peaceably share Jesus with everyone, not forcing them to believe, but sharing the truth with them from the heart in love. We are called to make peace within ourselves, in the church, in our relationships with others, without bitter envy, selfishness, partiality, or hypocrisy in our hearts. Notice we are to make peace, not just desire it, wish for it, hope for it. We have to actively create peace with the tools we have in Christ. To make peace in ourselves, we need to take our troubles to the Lord in prayer and completely trust Him with them, knowing that He loves us. Don't take my word on it. Let's read. Philippians 4, 6-7 through 7 tells us, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And this is the consequence. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Friends, if we take our troubles to God, the peace of God that's beyond all of our understanding and thinking, peace that just doesn't make sense, will protect our hearts and minds in Christ. This is the kind of peace Paul had in very, very bad situations. Now, this great promise should call us to prayer. That's the first thing. We can thank God for all that he's done for us and surrender our anxieties to God in faith, knowing that, as Peter wrote, he cares for us. Now, I, we have to picture our hearts like water. If the water is troubled, there's ripples and waves, and they affect every aspect of thinking. And that disturbed water is caused by unresolved problems and stress and anxiety that we have that are totally beyond our control. And these issues make waves as if they're thrashing and fighting within our hearts, like a storm was over the water. Now the only way to calm those waters is to give those unresolved issues to God in faith and wait for him to deliver us. As soon as we do that, we feel the waters of our heart become tranquil and just like on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus will calm the storms when we ask him to. This is the first step in being a peacemaker. We must have peace with God through the cross of Christ. Then we can have peace in our hearts through our relationship with him. That's what Paul's showing us. Next, we're also to make peace in the church. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 4, Paul passionately wrote this, this statement. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which, which you were called, in all lowliness, 
gentleness with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, first, to walk worthy of our calling, we're to endeavor to keep the unity in the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do we do this? Well, Paul tells us by living in humility, meekness, patience, and holding each other up in love. We're working hard to keep that unity and peace. He said, endeavoring. As we live out the teachings of Jesus in love, endeavoring towards Christ's goals and not our own, we'll make peace in the church as he's commanded us. But when peace is lost in any relationship, including those in the church, James tells us this is a direct result of impurity of heart, like we discussed last week. In James 4, 1 through 4, he wrote, Where do wars and fights come among you? Why do they happen? Do they not come from your desires and pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Then James adds this, chilling ending. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, do we desire our own pleasure or do we desire God's will? Are we lusting after power, control, or some other ungodly thing? Are we committing murder in our hearts as we hate our brother? Are we coveting something that doesn't belong to us, something that God has not given us? These attitudes are the opposite of being a peacemaker. This is being a troublemaker. James viewed troublemakers plainly as adulterers and adulteresses. People who were fornicating with the world even though they were supposed to be married to Christ. He tells us if we do act out of those ungodly desires that we make ourselves enemies of God who knows all of our interior motives. So just like the previous six Beatitudes, this one has an opposite, as James just revealed. Woe to those who are troublemakers, for they shall not be called sons of God. Notice James also revealed that the troublemaker not only excuse me, had a purity of heart problem, they also had a prayer problem, just as we saw with Paul. They didn't seek peace in their hearts, through their relationship with God, and they did not receive because either they did not ask or they asked with wrong motives. Friends, we must have a strong relationship with God through Christ to have peace in our hearts. Then we can make peace in the church and in our other relationships. Next, to make peace in our other relationships, which are outside the church, we must practice exactly what we just learned, but add to it the understanding that unbelievers may not always agree to have peace with us. Paul says this in a very poignant verse in Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. As we mentioned, those who reject the truth may persecute us, but even in those extreme circumstances, we can pray for them, share Christ with them, love them, and pray for peace with them. We must treat all people with meekness, humility, gentleness, mercy, and pure motives, if we're to be peacemakers. And their response does not change how we're supposed to treat them. Hebrews 12.14 gives us a very similar exhortation towards peace with a little bit different wording. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
We are to pursue peace. I like to picture this is like a car chase in a movie and we're just driving around trying to catch up to peace. You know, we're to go after peace. Even though it's elusively trying to get away from us, sometimes at great speeds. <coughs> now some unbelievers really, really want to hold a grudge against us. But we must pursue peace with them anyway. Even while they're wrong, because it could mean them spending eternity in hell if we don't. For example, there was a young Christian soldier in the military, and every night he would kneel down next to his bunk and privately pray to the Lord. And one of his fellow soldiers was very hostile to the things of God, and he would constantly make fun of our Christian friend soldier here. And one night, the hostile soldier actually took his muddy boots and threw it at him. And they, they really hurt him. They were dirty, they were heavy, they were embarrassing. And uh, instead of retaliating, he forgave the man who threw those boots at him and prayed even harder that night. In the morning, when the hostile soldier woke up, he found his boots cleaned and shined, sitting neatly at the foot of his bed. And his opinion of that Christian soldier was never the same. His heart softened, and not only did they have peace throughout their time staying together, several years later, this memory forever changed the way he saw Christianity, and he surrendered his life to Christ. In this way, we must pursue peace with all people, even unbelievers who persecute us. Now, why should we be this, this way? Why should we desire peace with people? Well, friends, because God has given us peace with himself through his Son, and our motivation should be his motivations. Remember pure in heart? Since Jesus has sacrificially given us peace with God, we're called to help others find peace with God. There's an amazing passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 18-20 where Paul tells us about this great ministry we have now. He wrote, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us this word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul just informed us, we're ambassadors for Christ. It's like God is pleading with the unbeliever through us to find peace with God. Reconciliation is simply the renewal of peace past animosity. In other words, the war ends, peace is restored. And the gospel is that word of reconciliation that we've been entrusted with. There's two parts of fulfilling this ministry of reconciliation that we've been given. First, to truly be a peacemaker, we must exemplify the Prince of Peace in our lives. That's why Jesus put six other Beatitudes before this one. He didn't do that as a mistake. As his ambassadors, we must understand that how we represent Jesus, how we live, directly affects how the world perceives Christ. What if that soldier threw the boots back? What if he took revenge? How would that man perceive Christ then? In 2 Peter chapter 2, we learn that false teachers will come into the church and many will follow their destructive ways, which will cause the way of truth to be blasphemed. Let's look at some key verses in this powerful chapter, beginning with verses 1 and 2. And friends, this is from the absolutely sure word of God. What he is saying was guaranteed to happen from the day he wrote it. 
But there were also false prophets among the people of Israel, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And here's the sad part. And many will follow their destructive ways. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. So far, Peter has explained, false teachers will secretly deceive many to follow destructive teachings. And because of that, Christianity itself will be blasphemed. False teaching can cause us to misrepresent Jesus and cause people to blaspheme this holy faith we have. It's very important that we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, as we read earlier in Philippians 1.27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's reported when Gandhi was asked why he would not consider converting to Christianity. He replied, I love Christ, but it's just that so many of you Christians are unlike him. That should tear us up inside. Our conduct must be worthy of the name we represent if we desire to make any peace in this world. Hell will certainly contain people who, like Gandhi, did not follow Jesus because his supposed followers didn't really follow him. We must remember that the Bible always states the gospel as this. Repent! and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If we're living in ongoing sin without turning away from it, we misrepresent the gospel and the name of Jesus Christ. In verse 3, Peter explains how those false teachers will get Christians to listen to them. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Friends, as we saw last week, purity of heart is so important. Impure hearts, and specifically greed and covetousness in our hearts, is an open door for someone to walk in and lead us away from the truth. False teachers will use covetousness to exploit the simple, and by following their false teaching, They'll misrepresent the name of Jesus. Your best life now, health, wealth, prosperity teaching, they don't fit in very well with the next two Beatitudes about persecution, let alone the rest of the New Testament. By covetousness, they will deceive. Now, why did Peter call the ways of these false teachers that many would follow destructive? Well, in verse 18 through 22, Peter begins to explain the destiny of those who follow these false teachings. For when they, these false teachers, speak great swelling words of emptiness, they're not full of the word of God, they're full of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Notice here again, impurity of heart and lack of a hunger and thirst for righteousness allows false teachers a way in, even from those who have already escaped from living in error in the past. Going back to verses 9 and 10, Peter explained, God knows how to reserve the unjust under punishment for that day of judgment, especially those who walk according to the lusts of the flesh and despise authority. These characterize the people who are deceived and who blaspheme the way. They walk according to their unclean lusts and they despise authority. The false teachers play on the lust of the flesh, 
pride, and every other evil motive of the heart to allure anyone who's already escaped from error back into the sin that leads to death. They use impurity of heart to lure people away from the truth. Well, Peter continues. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him he is brought into bondage. For if, after they had escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to know the way of righteousness than having known it, turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, a sow having been washed to her wallowing in the mire. Friends, to be ambassadors for Christ, true peacemakers, we cannot go back to wallowing in the mire of sin. We must resist false teachers, resist false teaching. We may stumble into sin, but it's not our lifestyle. Jesus taught us to put first the other Beatitudes on, such as meekness, purity of heart, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and the others, before becoming a peacemaker. As we can see, he did put them in this order for a reason. If we're living in ongoing sin, we must first turn from it and confess it to God. Then he will forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then have, after having our peace with God restored, we can become ambassadors for Christ. Now the second and obvious part of being an ambassador for Christ in this ministry of reconciliation is that we are called to help people make peace with God through the cross of Calvary. There truly is power in the blood as we know. Back in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, Paul had told us, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, who have been committed the word of reconciliation. God has given us this ministry of reconciliation, and God is like pleading through us, imploring people on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. It's committed to us. If we don't do it, who will do this? It's just as though God were pleading through us, so who's he pleading with? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we learn that God our Savior desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God desires that everyone get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, so we must share the gospel with Christ with everybody as peacemakers in this ministry of reconciliation. And one liberating truth is this. We don't have to convince them. We just have to tell them. In every account in Acts, whether it was Peter or Paul, they simply told the truth about Jesus in love, boldly. They were guided by the Spirit, spoke with great wisdom and truth, but they didn't force or browbeat anyone. They didn't have amazing arguments. They just told them what they knew. And they represented Christ in their lives. And every person they told was free to believe or not to believe. The results are not up to us, and we can take great comfort in that. So the points I'd like us to take away from being a peacemaker, which is such an enormous topic in the Bible, but we, we tried to cover most of it to this morning. Even though we are to be peacemakers, we will not always have peace with those who reject the truth. We're to live out the righteous life that we've been called to in peace, not with hostility or violence in the name of Christ. To be a peacemaker, we must first have peace with God through the cross of Christ. Then we can have peace in our hearts through our loving relationship with Him. Bitter envy and selfishness in our hearts will always 
cause peace to evaporate from any relationship. Some unbelievers may really want to hold a grudge against us, but we must pursue peace with them anyway. We're called to be ambassadors of Christ, helping others find peace with God through our lives and our speech. Jesus is the true peacemaker. He gave us peace with God and, and he gave us peace in our hearts. And as we put on Christ and live out his teaching in the power of the Spirit, making no provision for the flesh, we can be peacemakers, sharing that message of reconciliation as true sons and daughters of God. 